today are Megan Smith and myself, Desiree Stroys. We have community members Joy O'Shaughnessy, O'Shaughnessy and Kara Dahl. Kara Dahl. And we have some student panelists as well. Um, I think it's Kyle and Ashley as well are our student panelists. Um, so to remind you all, we did ask you to please turn off your cell phones. Um, they do say that even the vibrations are distracting. That being said, Liam, I will be having a timer on my phone for you to make sure that you understand the time. Um, huh? You have 15 minutes. I will alert you at 15, and at that moment, you will have five more. Okay? Um, just rubrics have been um, distributed to all panel members, correct? All panel members have a pen or pencil or ready implement. <coughs> Correct. Um, so, welcome to Liam <laughs> Sullivan Senior Exhibition. He will have 15 to 20 minutes to make his presentation. At the end of that time, the panel will deliberate and the audience will be asked to leave the room. Please do not leave before I dismiss you from this room. Please give Liam your respect and attention and be sure that all phones are off. After the presentation, I will have the panel go first and ask clarifying questions or find out some more information or things that they're curious about. After the panelists have all felt that their questions have been asked, I will open it up to the general audience to give them the opportunity to have questions as well. And then I'll dismiss you. The panel will go and make deliberations, see where you meet or exceed standards, etc. And then we will shortly call you back in to tell you our findings and have a discussion on that. Cool. Okay. So, without further ado, I welcome you to Liam Sullivan's pr presentation. Good morning, guys. Right. It's nice to see so many friendly faces on such a dreary morning. I'm Liam Sullivan. I'm going to graduate soon, but Senior X comes first. And so for these next 20 minutes, I will be talking to you about Kenya, about how I found my way to Kenya. And while doing this, we will be trying to subvert the fool's paradise, whatever that means. And so I was able to travel to Kenya on account of serendipity meaning that I got very lucky. Lucky in four ways. The first was that I have this graduation requirement, this thing called a senior X, that I knew would provide me the latitude to explore widely in an area of my choosing, and it provided a legitimate excuse. Second is I happen to know this wonderful woman named Aileen Sistone, who is on the left-hand side of the classroom. The third is that I chance across some interesting reading material that piqued my interest. And the fourth, and where we'll begin, is I have this lingering notion of something called the fool's paradise. So what exactly is the fool's paradise? Where does it come from? And what can become of rebelling against this idea, this notion of the fool's paradise? And so this is a term first proposed by Ralph Waldo Emerson in his 1841 self-help manual, Self-Reliance. And he explains to us that traveling is a fool's paradise and that we are those fools. So self-reliance was assigned reading in my junior English class, and it has remained with me, this idea of the fool's paradise especially. And I've since appropriated this term, imbued it with new meaning, and tried to shift the points of emphasis. And what I now mean when wielding this is that our travels rarely engender real meaningful growth, whether personal or otherwise. We return from vacation having maybe gained some weight, and if anything, more dissatisfied with our sordid realities, awaiting our next opportunity to escape. And so I've spent weeks in Cancun, in Florida, the Caribbean, among other destinations, staying at such places as the Hard Rock Hotel Riviera Maya, and enjoying these curated experiences. But by opting solely for these curated experiences, I have deprived myself of the full range of experience on so many occasions, of the opportunity to engage with the local populations, for example, with the place as it really is without any of the resort town pretense. And so when you return, I found that the experience often recedes along with my pen. And so I think travel can instead be an opportunity to accomplish, an opportunity to develop empathy, to appreciate our basic humanity, to enhance our own lives, and perhaps return home with something to offer our own communities. And this is what I hope to accomplish with my senior exhibition. I wanted to escape from this fool's paradise because I've so often inhabited it. My intention has been to travel, to engage with the experience, and to return and to share my experience with the MDI community. And so these are what I felt to be the three components of an escape from the fool's paradise. I felt if I'm going to travel, I must have a destination, some place to travel. While I'm there, I must have the opportunity for new learning. And that could be in any capacity. I felt that when I returned home, I must have a public platform to spread that new learning. Because I wanted to force myself to process the experience, to internalize it, and to allow it to coalesce with me as I was prior to, and hopefully return that positive. And I wanted to share 
with the community. I thought to manage these three things would be to stage a successful revolt, to travel with meaning. And so I found the first of these two components, a destination and a learning area, largely on accident, through some reading I was doing at the time. These are two names and two ideas. The first being Kwame Karuma. He's the first president of Ghana, a leader of their independence movement. And he's the first to use the term neocolonialism in an African context. He explains to us that the essence of neocolonialism is that the state which is subject to it is, in theory, independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system, and thus its political policy, is directed from the outside. The idea being that despite the absence of the physical presence, the former colonial power continues to exert influence through indirect means. And then there is Paulo Freire, with his pedagogy of the oppressed, an educational theory that is mindful of the dynamic between the oppressed and their oppressors. One that is proactive and seeks to promote mutual resolution between the two parties through education. And <laughs> we have no time to discuss these two ideas. And it's unimportant because it was the mingling of these two, this idea of neocolonialism as it relates to education, that began to prompt massive questions like, what does a neocolonial education system look like? <laughs> Where do Western non-governmental organizations, these humanitarian aid groups, come into the question? And is the work that they're doing on the ground actually perpetuating this system of neocolonialism? And these are questions of massive magnitude that I was and still am ill-equipped to speak of, and so I won't any longer. But these are the types of questions that I wanted to pursue, or at least something in these areas. And so I needed a destination that was formerly subject to colonial rule, and that was not the United States. And then I get really lucky, because I know this lady named Aileen Sister. <laughs> it means this ardent and luminous character within our MBI community, someone who I'm very happy to know, to call a friend, and to call my mentor. She's also the only native Kenyan I know to call this island her home. She belongs to the Kisi tribe, if any of you are wondering. She's very interesting. She grew up in the decades following the end of British colonial rule in Kenya. She's also a product of the Kenyan education system, spending her primary, secondary, and university years within that national system before emigrating to the United States to pursue her law degree. And so what I did not know at the time was that Aileen is also involved with this nonprofit called Flying Kites, a group providing primary education to crit critically poor children in rural Kenya. And so I began asking her all of these crazy questions about neocolonialism, about NGOs, the work they're doing on the ground, and their relationship with the local populations. And she appeased me by saying, let's just go to Kenya and spend some time with Flying Kites. And so suddenly I have a destination in Kenya and a learning area, education. And those are the first two components of what I felt would be necessary to travel with meaning. Um, and I must say that Eileen is entirely the reason that we ever got off the ground. It's through her connections and largely her credibility that I was able to finance this trip. We utilized her network while on the ground in Kenya. And she served as an indispensable resource throughout this entire thing. I'm still working on saying thank you. And no doubt I'll continue to dwell on this. And so we spent the first two weeks of May in Kenya. And we embarked on this venture, having set the condition that I would return and speak at COA's Human Ecology Forum about education in Kenya. And so this project is going to be about the experience, and about using that experience to return home and present my new learning in such a way that could generate conversations within our local community. And this anticipates my essential question, which is, how can I use my experience in Kenya to promote the free exchange of ideas within our local community? And so in order to do this, I needed new learning. And so here's some of my new learning acquired through the time on the ground. I'll be talking about public education in Kenya, an area that I think warrants more discussion. And I say this because nearly all public schools, particularly those in rural areas, are poorly funded and facing a set of daunting challenges. But there seems to be a proactive course of action that can help promote a much stronger, more unified Kenyan education system. And so we spent 10 days on the ground so our time between three rural primary school locations, the first of which was private, the other two were public. And our host for much of this time was Flying Kites. Flying Kites is this Boston-based nonprofit operating out of Jabini, this small town set in the foothills of the Aberdeer Mountains in what is a stunning region of, cent of Kenya's central province. Unfortunately, it's also very resource poor. Many of the farmers are sustenance, many of the locals are sustenance farmers, growing such nutrient poor crops as cabbage and potatoes. And so I found this to be a common point of disjunction throughout Kenya. You're in this beautiful location, surrounded by these scenes of abject poverty, that's forcing you to reimagine how you think of poverty. Um, and I 
on several occasions, try telling these locals that their home is beautiful. And you can see a visible disconnect, a lack of recognition. And you realize that it's a luxury to appreciate beauty. It's a luxury that we have that these people don't. But we do, fortunately, and so I can tell you how beautiful this area is. And so a little bit more about Flying Heights. They're a primary school, and in addition, they provide outreach to several resource-poor primary schools within the Jabini region. Their cardinal belief being that education is a mainstay along the path out of poverty. And so their support to partner schools comes either through direct funding, curriculum coordination, and recently they've initiated a teacher training program, empowering their educators, and through that, their students. And so now the entire Flying Heights Network includes nearly 3,000 students. And they've actually just added another school to their network in the last few days, which is cool. Um, and they've adopted what's called the whole child model. This is an approach to education that is mindful of the various needs of the child, whether those be social, emotional, cognitive, or physical. And it maintains that actualization, the child's potential, is going to be optimized when the needs of the whole child are being met. And so many of us, especially if we took human geography here, should be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is the same idea at play just apply. The idea being that the basic needs must be met before you can be concerned about providing such things as an education. And so I was fortunate enough to join two Flying Kites administrators for a visit to Mashabo Primary, one of those partner schools. And here's what the headmaster identified as the four primary barriers to providing his students with an education. And I will touch them only briefly. The first is that there are high rates of turnover on his faculty, meaning that there is, they're cycling through teachers at a high rate. Many of their teachers are poorly trained, and there's little opportunity for continuing education in these rural districts. Third is that infrastructure is always an issue, especially during the rainy season, when I'm sure you can imagine what the dirt floors must be like. Um, in addition, there's no insulation, no artificial light. And what I find to be most problematic, definitely the most unfortunate when considered with respect to Maslow's hierarchy, that there's no semblance of a feeding program. Many of these students, well above 50%, come to school without food daily, and they're leaving hungry. What's most unfortunate is that Mashabo is hardly unique. This is a typical primary school in rural Kenya. And nearly all of them are facing similar circumstances. They're wild to see. It's wild to see. It's wild to hear. And I think it prompts the question, how can the government permit this? Where are they? And are they able to assume an active role in trying to assist these schools? And so the question is that the government has long made earnest efforts and some impressive strides within the education sector. So the conversation kind of begins in the 80s with the Moy administration, where you see this massive expansion of public education. And Aileen will tell you that she's a Moy baby, as someone who greatly benefited from the reforms of this era. 2003, the government commits to providing free and compulsory primary education. 2008, they extend that to secondary education. And even today, it remains a prioritized item on the budget. For this most recent fiscal year, it's slated as the single largest expenditure. And so it's long been a priority, and it continues to be a priority. And so to be fair, the government has been successful and to a large extent. Kenya performs very well on non-monetary indicators of economic development, meaning that their workforce is highly educated. Literacy is one particular area. The World Bank's most recent survey offers a figure for the national literacy rate that approaches 80%, which is much higher than the regional average of 64% and one of the highest in Africa. And so Aileen's uncle happens to be a leading expert on education in Kenya. He's a member of parliament and formerly the minister of education. We were able to join Senator Aguirre for tea one afternoon and to gain a more complete understanding of the dynamic on the ground, to appreciate some of the complexities in the relationship between government and public schools. The quick answer he offered us as to why this is the state of the public education system is that the nature of the tax base limits any action that the government might make, that they're trying to do a lot with very little. He explained to us that rural public schools, like Mashabo, are suffering most from this house, this lack of funding. And so Mashawa, for example, receives very meager funding. The headmaster explained that they receive 100 Kenyan shillings per pupil per term, which is the equivalent of one US dollar, and that the school has faced budget cuts at 300% in recent years. And then, of course, you can consider this with in comparison to the per pupil current spending at MBI High School, which regularly ranges above $10,000. And so granted, there are complexities in these figures, but you understand the disparity, and I'll let that figure, that graphic speak for itself. So I think it's important to note that Professor Angiri is personally invested in education within his district. Him and his wife offset tuition costs for several school children. And as you listen to him talk, it's apparent that he's proud of these children and that he derives, derives great pleasure from watching them excel in their studies. Nonetheless, it says something that such an eminent player in Kenyan politics 
someone who understands public education so well, supports bids to private institutions in lieu of the public education that his government has made such an effort to advance. And if anything, it says that he's aware of the shortcomings and the need for adjunct support. This is where NGOs, non-governmental organizations, like flying kites under the conversation, because they can pick up much of the slack within the system, supplementing the government's efforts when necessary. And so Flying Kites has emerged as the premier primary school in the Jabini region. Their infrastructure is impressive. They're providing two or more meals daily to their students, and that food is delicious. Their educators are properly trained and work in an environment conducive to learning. And they've recently initiated a teacher training program as a facet of their outreach efforts. And so they've been largely successful in addressing the major shortcomings within the public education system through their whole child model. They've been empowering youth at their flagship, and they're beginning to do the same at their partner schools. And it's through this coordination between NGOs like Flying Kites and the national government that a consolidated model, one that is much stronger, will promote a more unified, much stronger Kenyan education system. And so I mentioned that Aileen and I had planned to speak at COA's Human Ecology Forum when we returned. This is a photo from that presentation on this past Tuesday, which I titled An Optimistic Portrait of Public Education in Kenya. And that presentation went well. We had something of an audience. Um, a lot of friendly faces, but we had an audience. Um, and so this experience has been a total deluge of stimulus. It's been a lot to process, but it has left me excited to promote the work of NGOs like Flying Kites within our community, and to try to bridge the divide between us and these communities in areas like Kenya, to promote this vision of the world as one global village. There will be a group of girls traveling to Kenya next year as part of the incipient MBI Africa initiative, and perhaps many more in the coming years. I'm happy to have been one of the first. And so to revisit my essential question, how can my experience in Kenya be used to promote the free exchange of ideas and information within our local community? I think this was accomplished through subverting the fool's paradise. By having the opportunity to travel, to learn, a very small portion of which is accounted for here, and to find an outlet for that new learning at COA's Human Ecology Forum, and to be able to promote these types of educational experiences for my peers at MDI High School and in the community at large. I'm here today to share with you and I'm always happy to have that opportunity. It saves me from the fool's paradise, and it keeps things interesting on this small island. Kenya is this land of infinite novelties, this place that leaves you frequently enchanted. We spend 10 days on the ground. I would happily spend a month, a year, perhaps a lifetime, and I'll be returning quite soon. Thank you, and a couple more thank yous to Aileen Sistone, first and foremost, for all of the help. Vicky Knox, our travel companion, um, while I was not able to incorporate it into the slideshow. Flying Kites for hosting us. Anyone who supported this venture financially. Miss Lehman, and all of our friends in Kenya, and MBI High School. Um, yeah, thank you, we're excited. I think my expectations, I thought I was traveling to Kenya, and I thought I was going to feel very white. Um, like a Mizzou, that's the Swahili for a white person. Um, I did not find that to be the case. I found that the most challenging thing for me to be is to appreciate how wildly different our socioeconomic situations are. So for example, we went to Jibiki Town one day, and with my friend James, who is pictured here, that's James. He has a very interesting story. Um, and we went to this cafe, and we ordered two cups of tea and some chapati. It's like kind of like non at this flat bread. Um, and I only brought thousand shilling notes, and the bill came to eighty shillings or something like that, um, which is eighty cents. And I tried to pay with this with this thousand dollar note, and I was literally chased out of the cafe because they didn't know what to do with this this large of a bill. Um, and so for me, I think the, the hardest thing is like, say it's about creating empathy and developing empathy, but it is so wildly different that sometimes it's hard, um, especially when you're talking about appreciating something like a dollar. Um, so that was a challenge, but people are so, I mean the hospitality, they're so welcoming, they're so receptive to us, and the locals understand that if they see Westerners on the ground, that they're either there supporting the local economy or that they're there doing work with NGOs, with groups like Flying Kites and, and working to, to help the area. Um, 
So I wasn't I, I wasn't necessarily challenged in that I didn't feel isolated and exposed. Um, but sometimes it's hard for me to, to remember where I am and how wildly different this is from my everyday reality. This is a hard question. And in the Cliff Notes version, can you summarize what your optimistic view was? Yeah, on it's this idea that you have this opportunity, you have this tiny government that is willing to and is committed to promoting education and to trying to work towards a much stronger system. And then you have groups like Flying Heights from other parts of the world who are there willing to coordinate with the government. And so it's this opportunity, A, to work for a much stronger, much better system of education, but also to promote this one unified vision, right? So it's like, there's no Kenya and United States. There's only like this one kind of mass working together and promoting this better world, kind of um, not being the optimistic portrait. Uh, yeah. Um, what ages um, were the kids that you visited? Like what, was it a primary school? Yeah, so or? primary school, um, buying kites primary school, so it's like K through 8. Um, but I spent a lot of time with older kids. So there are these Flying Kites ambassadors, James being one of them, and they're the original Flying Kites beneficiaries. Um, flying Kites was initially an orphanage. Um, and these kids all orphaned, and their stories, each of them has this crazy story. So this one kid named DJ was telling us we went to dinner with him one night, and he told us about, he recounted his childhood for us. He grew up in this slum called Kibira. Um, it's like the second or third largest slum in Africa. And he recalls like scavenging for scraps and contending with his with other children and digging through sewage lines, trying to pick out coins, um, trying to find money. Um, and so it, it is a primary school, but we spent a lot of time with kids like James with older kids. So, so the second part of my, my question is, um, since you were with kids that were your age, um, what kind of things did you find that you had in common? Yeah. Um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> Seriously, Game of Thrones is a big deal. Um, yeah, Kentucky Fried Chicken, which I, think I will always be used by that. Um, and like sports, all the like these are the they're the, they're the same. They're just teenagers, really. Um, even having grown up the way they have. So James actually is. He's recently taught himself to code. He first used a computer two years ago. And he was showing me some of his programs. And it's like hanging out with Massimo in, in calculus and having him show me this free rice, like this, this um, thing that generates and this like code that he's written for um, to do crazy things. I don't understand. I'm having the same conversation with this kid, James, who grew up in these squalid conditions. So not all that wildly different. Um, they dress rather nicely. Um, which is different, but <laughs> yeah, not wildly different. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question about just how you're going to um, are you going to keep sharing this information. I unfortunately yeah. missed your presentation at COA. I at COA, yeah, that. unfortunately. Um, so, like, this is not even close to full digest, and I was really struggling with how do I present this experience and do justice to this in my senior presentation. I don't think I have. Um, and so that's the question, right? And so it's like you have this, this MBI Africa initiative, something that AP has been trying to develop that will provide for these opportunities for exchange between MBI and, for now, Kenya, maybe East Africa more generally. And so Ashley actually will be putting a trip to Kenya. And so part of it is just like laying the foundation, the groundwork, um, speaking at COA, and just introducing these new ideas to. So you have the plans to keep going. Yeah, we'll see. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be returning, and flying kites especially is something dear to me at this point. I think quite a bit of, and will always be um, to promote their, their <coughs> community. Yeah. Um, did any experience you had in Kenya, or um, just in this, you know, time span alone, affect like your plans for the future? Yeah. So I have had thoughts. So I'm going to college next year. I don't yeah. know what I'm going to study. Um, I've had thoughts <coughs> of studying economics and just selling out. Make money because, like, <laughs> that's appealing. Um, but <laughs> that's, it's, it's true. Um, but I think that I'm particularly interested in economics in developing countries now. Uh, not that Kenya is actually a developing country, but um, we're trying to use like, this 
use economics as a way to promote a like, better world. Um, so maybe with my area of study, I'm actually interested in learning a language now. Um, I'm a pretty terrible Spanish student, but I would really like to learn Swahili. Um, and so in some ways, yes. And it's just it's just like made me more cogn cognizant of what this world is and some of the variety and like this commonality, this like basic commonality between all people and in all areas. So. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, can you describe some of the challenges to funding the trip? Yeah, oh my word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the most, I, I didn't have a chance to include this, but um, Aileen said, I have connections. Like, you prepare this cover letter and we'll send it through the, um, through the process and we'll get funding, no problem. But there was one day, uh, I was supposed to meet Aileen for a meeting at Chagalong Day. This was very, like, in the very early stages. And I was, <laughs> I had, I lacked that vision that, um, I, I had no idea what I was trying to do with this project. And so I show up with Aileen, and Aileen's kind of nervous. She's, like, looking around her head. She's on a swivel. And all of a sudden, I see this, this like, squat lady walking into Chocolate. Um, and she comes over to our table, and she introduces herself. And Aileen had invited a potential donor to this meeting, and I had no idea about it. And so I spent the better part of 45 minutes just flailing, um, trying to ask, like, convince this lady that this is not merely a vacation, and that she should support this venture. Um, and it, that's why I said uh, this was funded through Aileen's credibility, because this donor has actually provided a substantial chunk of the funding. Um, and only because Eileen is so credible, not because I was compelling or because I was, <laughs> I was humiliating myself. I like I do this thing where I retreat when I don't know what I'm talking about. I retreat and I start using big words and kind of <laughs> retreat into like verbosity and just like saying things that no one else understands. I don't really understand, and that, that's the point I was at. I'm uh, talking about like, like these schools of linguistics, like I'm trying to be Kenya, and so. Um, but yeah, that was that was um, one of the challenges for funding. But otherwise, people are very receptive on this island to to these types of things, and um, the funding is there, the support is there for these types of things. So yeah. Hi guys. At this point, I would like to open any further questions. We do only have a few minutes, but any further questions that we'd like to have, I'd love to hear what you guys have. Okay. Yes, excellent. Aside from uh, economics, would you ever consider uh, working for an NGO or teaching in that yeah, environment? Yeah, absolutely. So this guy, Connor Troy, he actually, he's the recent hire. He's the head of their teacher training program. Um, he's a Notre Dame grad, went to Columbia graduate school. And he's actually just located, or he's been in Kenya for about a year and a half now, and he does teaches. And so that's something very appealing to me, especially as a younger, as a younger dude, um, especially in a place like Kenya and Nairobi, where there's a large expatriate com like, population, and you're not like living in huts in the middle of nowhere, because um, that doesn't necessarily appeal to me, but something like this just does more so. Um, so definitely perhaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely perhaps. And then just like, the good things, like, it, it leans on the board of flying tights, and so right. to serve in that capacity as well um, would be cool. Yes. Uh, was there anything um, vastly different in Kenya than what you were expecting? How very, um, I expected more British influence, because they were colonized by the British. Um, and I expected to be like, I'm in mean Britain, but that's not the case. Aside from the language, uh, like 4 o'clock tea, we had tea every day, which I love. Um, and in fact, you drive on the other side of the road, and there are like transoms above all the doors. But aside from that, it's like not so British at all. Um, or if it is British, it's more British in the like, upper echelons, in, like the, the higher echelons, the higher class. Um, that surprised me, and I was I was put off by not put no not put off. Um, I was expecting, like I said, I was expecting to feel white. I was expecting to like be. I had this idea that it would be exhausting to be constantly tuned in to the color of your skin, to your race. Um, and that was not the case at all. Like, I very rarely did I feel white. Um, which was interesting. Because you know, I realized that race is much less of a thing other places. You make an awful lot to feel out of it, so, yeah. 
Thank you guys for being an excellent panel. Thank you.